Good afternoon. Um, here in Brussels, there is a very, very good weather after <laughs> very terrible and difficult days. So I'm not sure how many uh, participants we will have, uh, taking into account that this is not so often uh, such a wonderful sun. Uh, at the same moment, I'm uh, very, very pleased uh, that uh, in the European Green Party, we have organized this uh, uh, special session uh, regarding uh, the uh, recovery and resilience facility at the national plans, uh, because exactly this is the moment where uh, important decisions are taken. And uh, we would like really uh, to be able uh, to discuss uh, with uh, the member parties, with the delegates, with you, exactly what's going on, what are the possibilities, how we can act, but also make an evaluation uh, on the basis of what uh, uh, we have received until now and the publication of the national plans on uh, how uh, the degree of, uh, uh, of uh, compatibility with uh, the climate goals, uh, with the environment, with the biodiversity, but also with the social dimension that we would like uh, to fulfill, uh, the generational uh, goals, the gender balance, and all the rest of the indicators that they have been linked with uh, these recovery uh, and uh, resilient uh, plans. So my name is Vula Tsetsi. I am a member of the committee coming from Greece and uh, I am uh, in parallel the Secretary General of the Greens uh, in uh, the European Parliament. I would like uh, to uh, present you shortly by order of, uh, uh, let's say, the presentations, uh, the uh, very special uh, uh, people that we have uh, around, uh, around us. And starting with uh, Ertes, er, Ernest Turtasun, who is a member of the European Parliament, Vice President of the group uh, and uh, shadow for uh, the recovery plans, but also member of uh, uh, the special working group in the European Parliament who monitors uh, these plans. Um, we have uh, uh, Timon Werner, uh, uh, head of uh, Berlin office from the Wupperter Institute. Uh, welcome and very happy to have you here. Uh, Felix uh, Hellman, a researcher from the E3G, and also uh, Anelia Stefanova uh, is uh, the, from the Bank Watch Network. Uh, these uh, three uh, networks, they will uh, and institutes, they will be able to make a presentation, an horizontal presentation, on the state of play of uh, their foundings because they uh, make uh, quite a lot of research, especially when it comes to uh, the uh, climate calls, the goals, the environment, the biodiversity, and also the participation of uh, civil society and, uh, uh, and uh, um, uh, the different actors outside, of course, uh, the governments which they presented the plans. Uh, last uh, but not uh, least, we have uh, two national parliamentarians, uh, Malgor Zata Trax, who is co-president of the Polish Greens uh, in uh, uh, the parliament and member of the parliament, and uh, Lorenzo Fioramonti, Italian uh, MP, national parliamentarian, ex-minister uh, uh, for uh, education in Italy, and uh, member of uh, uh, the the component in the European, in the sorry, in the national parliament, Facciamo Eco Federazione dei Verdi, which is somehow uh, the form of representation of uh, uh, the Greens in the national parliament. So very, very happy to have you here. Together with us, we have also Lola, Stevan, and Saki, part of the team, which I would like to thank them uh, for the whole pre preparation and also for the help that they will give us uh, during uh, this uh, workshop. Um, I would like also to uh, tell you an extra thing. You will have the possibility in uh, the chat 
to put your questions. We will collect them. And once uh, the presentations, they will be over, uh, we will uh, uh, try to, uh, to give you the maximum of the responses. And I hope that I will be able to make a kind of uh, conclusion with some concrete proposals at the end of uh, this uh, session. So without losing more time, I would like immediately to pass the floor to Ernest. And uh, we agreed that uh, we will uh, keep the time between uh, seven, eight minutes with the exception of Timon and also Felix who will have the longer presentation. Um, and we will have some presentations also uh, on slides, which of course I suppose you will be able to get afterwards. Thank you very much. Ernest, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Vula. It's a real pleasure to be here with uh, with all of you this afternoon. I think it's very important that we uh, dedicate this uh, parallel session to the um, to the recovery plans, which are, are going to to shape European. Uh, we have a small problem, Ernest. Yeah. Yes. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. No. So. Uh, yeah, okay. The, so the, the first thing I would like to say um, is that um, uh, we worked a lot as a Greens on the on the regulation to have very uh, a strong um, conditions for that spending. Eh? So I think that today uh, the framework of the regulation uh, is uh, strong. Of course, we wanted more, but it's strong enough to defend that this money uh, goes uh, into uh, the direction uh, of achieving a carbon neutral society in, uh, within the time frame that we have uh, decided um, uh, in the climate in the climate law that we will decide in the climate law European level. Eh? Uh, so it's very clear for us, and that we managed to include that that thirty seven percent of the money needed to be spent concretely in actions to fight climate change, and also that the whole uh, uh, investment uh, needed to respect uh, the so the so called principle of the no significantly harm that, as you probably know, is anchored in the in the taxonomy regulation as well, uh, which means that. Uh, uh, that uh, uh, the majority of uh, of uh, investments, a broad range of investment, which which are highly polluted, are uh, uh, completely, uh, completely excluded. So the, the regulation, I'm saying that because I think that the regulation is strong enough for us uh, to fight and to guarantee really a green recovery. Uh, we were, uh, uh, of course, we wanted more, but I think we were uh, pretty much satisfied on that front. Um, and of course, when we worked on the regulation, there were other aspects that for us were very important. Firstly, we wanted that the projects had, had really an added value uh, and that also that the, there was a social component uh, on the spending. And then another element which we fought a lot, even though in the regulation is more weak, this I have to admit, uh, which is how do we secure that the spending guarantees a uh, uh, gender equality uh, in the recovery. And uh, as Greens, we wanted that regulation uh, uh, mandated uh, the, uh, the every single recovery plan to really uh, have uh, um, uh, an analysis, action by action, and investment by investment on the impact on gender equality. This we did not manage to have, but we have in the regulation a provision which says that all the member states need to explain how the member uh, how the recovery plans will affect gender equality. So, in a sense, this is a moment where we are pushing the Commission to make the best use of that uh, of that particular paragraph, which the Greens included in the in the regulation. So. And the same for biodiversity, eh, which was uh, also an important target for us. We really wanted bio to, to have a, a concrete spending target for biodiversity in the regulation that we did not, we did not manage to, uh, to achieve, but we do have in the regulation the requirement for member states to do actions on biodiversity. So at least that we have in the legal text. So as you know, the regulation uh, was adopted uh, uh, some months ago, and now the crucial element for everything to kickstart uh, was to have the own resources decision to be uh, uh, endorsed in all member states, because without that, the Commission cannot go to the markets to issue the necessary uh, uh, debt uh, for the investments. Uh, fortunately, yesterday, all the members uh, were complete. So now the Commission can already go to the markets and the Commission has already presented uh, a plan uh, for the emissions for this year and for next year, which would um, uh, guarantee that the 13% 30, of prepayments that need to arrive already in July will be there. Huh? So the commission now, after the ratification of their own resources, 
that says that the prepayments, when the national recovery plans are approved, will arrive. So it will be this 13%. This is also a figure that in the regulation we fought to have it uh, higher than it was at the beginning, which was only at 10%. So now we are at the moment very important moment, as Bula was saying, where the, the member states are presenting uh, the recovery plans. As far as we know, all of them, all member states will present the recovery plans before summer, except for the Netherlands, which will present it after the summer, uh, which means that the Commission will start analyzing the plans and issuing the, 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 uh, the uh, implementing acts to be endorsed by the, by the Council. And once the, the plans are approved, then the prepayment can come. How are we controlling from the parliament all that process? Well, what we have decided is to create a specifically ad hoc working group to control uh, uh, how the, the commission is assessing those plans. Uh, so this working group is already in, uh, uh, working. Uh, we are analyzing uh, the, 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 the work of the commission uh, from a, uh, um, an objective uh, perspective uh, as established in the regulations. So we do analysis for the climate spending, we do analysing for the social component of the spending, we do analysing on the participation of, of stakeholders. So we're doing uh, uh, several, uh, several uh, sessions, but we are at the moment checking really on the recovery plans uh, and what, what is in there. And here I think is what sessions like the session we have today will be very useful because we are trying to collect as much as we call rotten tomatoes as possible in the sense that we want really to know exactly when we have uh, national recovery plans which are practicing greenwashing, which are investment money in issues that the regulation does not allow it to, uh, to be, or whether when they are just recycling old projects and this is supposed to have an added value that we really uh, can push the commission to be uh, strong on there. And uh, for that, we have two moments which are going to be very important in the next months. Firstly, as a Greens IFA group, we are going to send a letter to the commission uh, with different elements on the problems that we are already encountering in, in several uh, recovery plans that are presented. But secondly, the parliament will uh, adopt a resolution uh, in, this, in the plenary on, of June. We have two plenaries in June, on the second plenary of June at the end of the month, where, where we will try as well to push very hard uh, and particularly uh, to make the climate to the climate goals being respected, which which is one of the things that uh, for us, of course, is more important and that the do not significantly harm principle uh, is uh, is respected. Now, there is another component of, of all this process, which is very important for us to take in mind. As you know, uh, and, 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 and this probably will get me to the end because I have seven minutes, I've already spoken six, but one of the important components is the reforms that will be attached to the investment. Okay, so this is an instrument for investment, but for reform, which means that every member state will have to present a plan uh, of, uh, of national reforms associated uh, to the investment plans, which has to fulfill the requirements of the country-specific recommendations of 2019. So here the commission is uh, doing an exercise of negotiation with several member states. Well, of course, with Spain and Italy, which are the two biggest recipients of the funds, uh, in order to address issues like labor market problems, uh, pension sustainability, etc. This, as a group, we are trying to play an important role of controlling that all these reforms that will be uh, associated to the uh, to the uh, investment plans are socially balanced, so that there is no temptation to go back to the old uh, to the old uh, 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 anti-social reforms that were um, uh, um, promoted in the last uh, in the last. Um, in the last financial crisis, and, and at the same time, we want that all the members, all the member states, deliver on reforms, huh? because we also know, and this is something that we want, that several member states have recommendations in order for them to change the, their aggressive tax planning, uh, and this is something the Commission has announced they want to do, and of course we will also be looking at, at, at that. And so we want, if in the country-specific recommendations of 2019, there are elements uh, on taxation that need to be addressed, we want those member states to address those. So this this uh, reform component, I think, um, I think is going to be a very, a very important. And lastly, and I will end here, I think one of the most important issues for us to control uh, is uh, to have the regional, the local level, and the stakeholders at national level to be able to participate in the, the design implementation of the recovery plans. So this is going, one of the things that in the working group of the parliament we will look at very closely. Um, we have in the regulation specifically the local authorities mentioned as key, as key players. Uh, so it's important as well that they have their say and they have their participation in the national recovery plans. And this is something that we are uh, looking at. So Vula, I would maybe end just by saying that in all these elements, 
the next steps, important steps for us are the letter that we're going to send to the commission and the resolution in June. And any element, we are in dialogue with different NGOs and with, uh, with the unions on that on a regular basis, but anything also as member parties that you believe that is important for us to know on the recovery plans of your, of your member states, please let us know, because this is an information, of course, that we can use in pushing the commission to really make the regulation be respected. So voila, this would be my introductory words. And uh, thank you so much for, for, for organizing this. Thank you, Ernest. So without losing time, I will uh, just give the floor uh, to Timon and also to Felix for the presentation. Yeah, thank you, Nguna, and, and thank you, Ernest, for, for uh, introductions and, and inviting us. Uh, Felix and I will present you some um, analytical work for the Green Recovery Tracker we've done, and there also is a website if you want to look into details. Uh, um, Next slide. Ernest, you, you made a reference to the financial crisis. And actually, for me, the financial crisis was a time of tears. Uh, I was crying not so much of the financial crisis, but also of, of how we dealt with it. And if we look at the money uh, that was spent and how it was spent, I found that uh, terrifying from a German perspective. Uh, while some of us were going to Copenhagen, others spent billions of money to, for support for German cars. Uh, without any climate or green uh, strings attached. And uh, next clip, Felix. It, the, the amount of money is much less than, than we're seeing uh, being spent today. But uh, also an analysis we did at the time was how much green there was in the spending for the financial crisis globally. We see that most of the countries, especially European countries, had very little green shares. Uh, South Korea and China actually being countries that had at the time much higher shares of green spending in how they dealt with the financial crisis. Next slide. So I was really happy to see some call for action in terms of, oh, make this a green recovery, sustainable recovery from the EU, from the World Bank, from many countries. And, and there is a big narrative around this. So this was a good, uh, yeah, good thing. Uh, next. And as Ernest has said, there is if we just look at the EU money and not the national money in the EU recovery and resilience facility, there's a lot of money. I mean, it's more than 300 billion in grants and there is clear uh, earmarkings for putting this into climate and biodiversity and digital transform. So next slide, um, the, the colleagues from, from uh, E3G and us from Wuppertal Institute, we sat together and said, okay, we really want to look at of what is, what is actually in those recovery plans. Um, and just to sketch very quickly our approach, we look at really the long-term economic measures, not the short-term uh, things, the, the very uh, early things. Um, we look at, at climate change uh, impacts only, right? Um, we don't look at biodiversity and uh, the gender and social issues, not because we don't find it important, but just because of question of capacity, uh, it's, it's, that is difficult enough methodology uh, wise. And speaking of methodology, we, we build on the RF regulation, on the EU taxonomy, but not one-on-one. -on -one. Actually, we started developing our methodology earlier and we take some freedom to, to be a little bit more critical in some points. Um, and we're not doing this uh, as A3G and Wuppertal Institute only by ourselves, but actually we liaise very closely with national experts in all the countries that we work with. And thanks to those, and uh, Anilia is, is a person we've been in, in exchange and, and others where we couldn't do that just from our desk, but we really need the national views. Next slide. So I will very quickly give you a sketch of our methodology and then Felix will go into, into the details. We have six categories, two positive category, a very positive, which is basically things that are, are high ambition that we see that are in line with long-term um, net zero by 2050 or earlier uh, targets. Then there are things which we consider positive, but those are things that are have maybe little lower standards or where there's a big package where a small part of that package goes into things which we think are either so-so or actually supporting fossil fuels, but the overall uh, package is positive. And then we have two negative, um, a very negative, which would be like really support for fossil fuels. 
and negative things like uh, general tax cuts, like uh, VAT uh, cuts, uh, like hybrid cars, things that are actually promoting an unsustainable economy. And then there's two categories which are will be become important. One is there is a likely effect, right? But we don't know in which direction this is going. I'll go into that in a little bit more detail. And there's a lot of things where we say, actually, the climate effect could be probably very marginal. A lot of health issues, for example, um, uh, where we say that's important, that's good. We don't want to call this good or bad in terms of climate, but it's not it's not green. Next. When uh, Felix will show you green spending shares across all countries, and uh, just to know how we uh, calculated those green spending shares, and that's the 37% that Ernest was also referencing to, we count the budget, which we put into a very positive box to 100% and to the positive box as to 40%. And that weighted average then makes what we call the green spending share. And that is actually in line with uh, uh, RF regulation. Next, cool. Um, but as I said, we are only looking at climate mitigation, um, but I think the, the resulting differences in terms of biodiversity should actually be marginal for most countries. Next. And we don't have a, a neutral category. We decided against that, but we found that not accessible is, is something um, that that is often the case. And I'll go into a little bit more detail next. Because just to, to give you a sense for our methodology, there are some tricky cases, right? Um, for example, there's some mixed funding for some things which we call positive and other things which are negative, like energy efficiency, but at the same time, there's support for gas for boilers. So this is something we uh, sometimes put in the box, likely climate effect, but not accessible. Similar for hydrogen, right? There's hydrogen gas infrastructure, which sounds great, but then actually there is often many loopholes for, oh, we use this hydrogen in an interim phase for gas, uh, natural gas, where we think, well, how long is that interim phase till 2040? Then it's definitely not a positive development. Um, there's a lot of measures without conditionalities, right? Research, like infrastructure for municipalities or digitalization, right? These are good things, but what, what is infrastructure for municipalities, right? Is that roads or is that tramways? Is that energy efficiency in schools? We don't know. And actually this is, I think, an important point. There's very many things where we don't know yet. The definitions are rather short in the plans and, and it will not depend only on the plans which are decided in the next weeks and months, but also the implementation on a national level. Um, yeah, next, and I hand over to you, Felix. Thank you so much, Timon, and thank you also from my side for the opportunity to speak here today. It's a real pleasure. Um, as Timon already said, this is a look at our website itself. So all the data and results that I'm going to present and that Timon has also presented, you can find on the website. We also there release the data that's underlying the assessment. So if you think, okay, my country is assessed way too positively, way too negatively, you can really go and look how we've assessed the individual measures. So we I really think it's important for us to be transparent about how we uh, come to the overall numbers. I mean, here you can already see we've got a bit of a split between the European countries. And if we look at the data we found so far across those countries, we see that many, um, some of these are still draft plans, some of these are the final plans, recovery plans are really in danger of missing this important 37% climate spending target that's part of the regulation. So that's the orange line you can see. There's uh, some countries, Finland is doing the best on this um, chart here, but most countries are in this box between sort of 20 and 30%. So um, there, there being really a risk of them falling short. Uh, we do always say, you know, a place like Belgium got 35% based on our methodology. We wouldn't go out and say that's a massive reason for concern because this can obviously always be sort of technical questions, maybe certain data we didn't have and then couldn't set the measure positively, et cetera. But there's really a lot of countries that are doing really quite badly. And, and now I guess the obvious question is, so, so why is it the case, especially with governments? I mean, all of these governments do say that their plans achieve 37% or even higher. Um, I think one reason is um, really what Timon just said about countries having these um, measures that they assess positively, that we just can't assess positively yet based on the lack of information we have. So as Timon said, one quarter of all the spending we've assessed so far, so that's 421 billion euros, is in this bucket of it's going to have a climate effect, but we can't assess it yet. And often governments, of course, then go and say, okay, but we say this is a positive measure. 
where we say, okay, we can't. Um, I mean, this is, for example, something that we've seen quite often is that there are positive on paper energy efficiency measures that governments do assess positively that may, for example, include um, fossil gas boilers. So there's a real question mark there, but that, that's not actually positive also based on the RF methodology. It's also about the RF methodology for those who are following it a bit more closely, they will know this distinguishes in some cases, for example, an efficiency between um, let's say very good measures with more ambitious standards and less good measures with less good standards that only get the 40% kind of contribution. And there's often the question of are governments actually sharing enough information to warrant the high climate tech? And in many cases, based on what our national partners also tell us, that's not the case. Also, there's a lot of investments um, coming into this bucket into building projects, into industry projects that just don't have strong enough climate standards, but where Either it's actually necessary for governments to provide those because they claim they will have a positive climate impact. So, for example, in the Portuguese plan, a really large share of the funding goes into new housing projects, which the government claims that gets a 30% climate check, which can be true if this is, I think, zero emission housing, which obviously is quite a big challenge to achieve. If they manage to do that, that would be great. But also there's a lot of industry funding where, as Timon said, there's no climate tax attached. And that's uh, really, I think, a bit concerning because in 2021, if governments really mobilize large amounts of money into, into building houses, into um, spending on their industry ba industrial base, it's, it's really important to align that spending as well with climate targets. So that sort of explains this very large share of spending we have as having a likely effect, but not accessible. So, so overall, quite a lot of question marks around these things. And we think that the review that's taking place by the European Commission, but also the institutions more generally right now is really crucial to also specify those things. And um, there's also this process as part of the review of defining milestones and targets that will essentially regulate when the money will be made available to member states. So certain uh, performance indicators, essentially. And ideally, this process will then also provide more information for us to be essentially shrink that pie and in an ideal world, really say, OK, we now have the assurances we need to say or to be confident this money will actually be spent on green activities and on not on harmful activities. But the jury is still out on that. So overall, um, still, I think, quite quite some way to go in terms of really um, assuring that the RF targets are met in all member states. We have seen improvements throughout the process um, in some of the plans, but I think when it comes to sort of the really, because I think that's also the title of this event today, the transformative recovery, um, I, I'm not sure we're there yet completely at the moment. And again, happy to speak more about this, but also the national data is available on our website. Um, we decided to not sort of speak about individual countries in detail now, happy to do that in the Q&A, um, but, but I think this is almost, almost a trend we're seeing across Europe. And maybe some final observations that really put this into context a bit, but also some um, political um, impulses perhaps for the debate afterwards. First of all, I think it's really important to think about this whole recovery debate against the backdrop of the new EU 2030 climate target, in general, the urgency to act on climate. And of course, also, as Timon said, the strong consensus regarding the importance of a green recovery. So I think this isn't a status quo or business as usual debate. We really politically, but also you know, based on the science, have this momentum and the urgency to act now. And everyone from the IEA to the World Bank, to the European Council, to the European Parliament has really underlined that. So we we should and we have to really put strong standards against what's happening right now. Um, and we also know, of course, that's necessary to do. I mean, the Commission's own impact assessment for the EU target says that there needs to be a doubling in public and private investment in the energy transition uh, until 2030 based on today's level. So the recovery facility funds are one really crucial opportunity for delivering that and perhaps also a really important test for whether we can actually deliver the European Green Deal on the ground in the real economy. Second point is that a transformative green recovery really requires recovery plans that are based on strategic approaches to economy-wide decarbonization. So this is perhaps a bit of a um, general point. What we mean by this is that essentially most governments, and what we've heard, what they did is they essentially went around their ministries and said, OK, look, we need to write, write this recovery plan. Let, let's try and assemble a list of investment projects, things we can invest money in. They then had very, very long lists of investment projects, potential investment projects, and then sort of, uh, again, cut that list down to, in the end, come up with a final plan. And I think one of the key reasons why we um, sort of hear a lot of our national partners also being quite critical about the recovery plans in many countries is because of that approach. Because those countries like Finland were actually the opposite. We looked at uh, sort of strategic decarbonization frameworks that were already in place or really um, tried to advance that conversation as well, often did a lot better when it comes to green spending as well. So essentially using that money, using the opportunity of the recovery facility to really advance the decarbonization debate uh, on a strategic level in the country. But again, most countries didn't do that. And I think what's really problematic is that many government priorities are also just out of date. So many governments based their 
uh, recovery plans on old uh, national energy and climate plans, for example. Now, that's understandable on paper. These plans are um, in power, but at the same time, we know that we have the new EU climate target right now. We know that this will necessitate governments to increase the energy transition targets. So if there's additional funding available right now, why not use that to say, okay, let's actually ramp up ambition. Let's go and be more ambitious here. Unfortunately, there's only very, very few governments have actually done this. So that's a bit of a missed opportunity perhaps as well. And as the last point, because we're getting also to the end of our time, um, I think overall, it's not yet certain whether the EU will achieve a truly green recovery and the jury is still a bit out on this. And there's probably dimensions to this. First of all, when it comes to where money will actually be spent, the review of the national plans is really an important credibility test for all European institutions. And I think right now, especially the European Commission, will they actually stand up to governments? Will they uh, make sure the Green Deal is being delivered on the ground? Um, as I said, we've seen plans uh, making, having some improvements, but also um, it, it is a big challenge for them. And lastly, and I will end here, the recovery facility is also linked, though, to promising structural development. So the willingness to engage uh, in deeper joint EU financing and deeper oversight in the updated climate tracking methodology and in general, the quite uh, good RF regulation. Uh, these are still things that probably will be really promising and something to go back to in the future, um, also to enable more climate action. I guess the question is, will they be able to deliver in time in terms of the timeline we have left to really uh, get the action on climate going in the economy? Thank you very much. Thank you uh, for um, not only the presentation, but also uh, respecting the time. So we go straight to Anelia uh, for the next seven, eight minutes. Uh, so Anelia, the floor is yours. Good afternoon. Um, I would just share my screen in a second. Thank you very much for that opportunity. I really think that it's very, very important that you uh, we continue speaking about the recovery and resilience plans. Um, there was not enough of, uh, of talks around that. And, um, and therefore, I think it's also, we hope it will not be really a missed opportunity as it's my title of my presentation. Um, so I will try to touch upon three issues um, quickly, transparency and public involvement, long-term resilience of the plans and uh, building back uh, better on biodiversity. Uh, I would speak on behalf of Seabank Watch Network, which is a wide network of um, grassroots organization in Central and East Europe. We have more than 20 years of experience in monitoring of EU funds. So in, 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 some, in certain sense, um, our knowledge and expertise um, shows indeed uh, how, how, I mean, our research also shows how public, uh, public sector managed to to access and get um, involved, involved into the discussion of the, of the planning of the, uh, the plans, because we, my colleagues was um, quite actively working with um, to, to get information, to be involved in the plans since already last summer. So we was, let's say, one of the most active parts of the society in Central East Europe. And if we did not manage, it's also mean that also the rest of the uh, many other actors like local authorities and business sectors were also excluded. Um, so, indeed, as I mentioned, we started a long, long time ago indeed, to, to watch out uh, what is the, the drafting process of the recovery plans. And unfortunately, um, it was a very centralized process driven um, by, the, by the government and uh, very much behind closed doors. Um, in cooperation with, other group, with groups um, like the Climate Action Network in February, we did make assessment of 20 countries. Uh, and the uh, availability of the documents, um, the consultations of the public uh, of the recovery plans, also the involvement of the uh, civil society into the working groups and um, how much the comments or uh, demands um, raised by civil society was taken on board. And the, the first result was uh, this table, which we published in February, very bad situation in most of the sea country, most of the countries around Europe, especially also in the, in the sea region, where uh, we dis, do see very um, again uh, very lack of very much lack of transparency in open public consultation, uh, in terms of responsiveness and integration of what civil society asked. Uh, there was very low involvement at, at that time, um, so. The, Three months after that, um, plans are already submitted. Some of the plans are already submitted, and what we see is that some of them did improve. But primary, where the civil society and uh, other stakeholders were involved, I mean, we did see uh, that we, together the joint work with the Commission, some of the measures were removed. I mean, very specifically, very harmful measures. Uh, but uh, a lot of public 
proposals was not taken on board. I mean, there is much more room for improvement in the plans. Um, so we should not take it as a, as a done deal. And uh, clearly also the commission um, is emphasizing this. I mean, Gentiloni is, uh, Commissioner Gentiloni spoke a few weeks ago in, in, in the parliament saying that uh, drafting was just a first stage and public participation is, um, is important. Uh, I think the commission realized very well the risk of, um, of not involving public and not shared ownership about the future of the plants. And uh, these are the recognition that they should be much bigger open and, and better open process for the uh, implementation and um, revision of eventually revision of the plans later. But we need to make an effort to really to achieve that. I mean, a lot of um, our common um, pressure and uh, letters, as was mentioned early by Ernst, will be very, very useful to really um, put the pressure on the commission to, to open the process, which is uh, for the monitoring of the plans. Currently, it's not um, yet fully clear how it would be done and how transparent it would be. And um, the last issue on transparency is the, the, who, the, the quality of the plans and um, the, the overall information which was available. Um, it was mentioned pre previously by Timon, um, a lot of information was not available to the public, specifically do not significant harm assessment, which is a key information for assessing the environmental impact of the, of the projects. Um, most of the plans um, was just uh, re releasing guidelines. I mean, like Estonia, for example, just published um, two, two, two days ago, uh, 300 pages. So far, the public was able to comment only on like uh, something like 10 pages of document, which uh, shows out, outline of the, of the public intention, of, of the government intention, but uh, no, no details about the plan. So we, we, could, we could not even spot where the, where the problems are. Um, and with that, I could want, want to move to some of the problems. Indeed, um, the plants unfortunately have too much of what we should not see them in them and too, too little of what we need them to be really long-term resilience plants. I just want to have a one, to mention one example about the, the gas projects, uh, which um, we're publishing this briefing on next Monday. Uh, we mm, assess that uh, in the sea countries, there are more than two billions of euro currently supporting directly or indirectly gas use. Um, and um, in the in the in the moment where the European uh, the International Energy Association is calling for phasing out all fossil fuel subsidies, uh, we do have a lot of negative uh, projects which are even sometimes tagged as a climate positive. I mean, just to mention Bulgaria proposing. 240 million for a gas pipeline to be built to one of the coal regions. Um, we don't believe the subsidies, uh, European funds, and uh, especially the long-term public debt should be used to be subsidizing gas projects. And um, unfortunately, our countries was the one which was um, uh, very much supporting the gas inclusion, but uh, indeed the regulation speaks about very limited and very case by case approach. And in, we, unfortunately we see that uh, the government, our governments use that opportunity to really widely open the door and propose a number of projects which should be excluded. And um, I could move to the next one, which is our assessment on the biodiversity aspect of the recovery plans. Um, as I mentioned earlier, I mean, we, um, unfortunately, we didn't get the air marking for biodiversity and indeed the result is very bad. I mean, currently uh, from 10 euros spent on, uh, on recovery, then only three cents would go for biodiversity in, in Central and East Europe. Um, this is very problematic because, I mean, uh, in our region, whatever is in the recovery plans and spent in the, uh, it's allocated for the EU funds would be also in our 10 years spending, um, uh, public and private spending. So no investments and no reforms in that sector uh, would mean that the biodiversity crisis will be largely forgotten. By the, by the governments. Um, and uh, we do need to tackle currently biodiversity and climate crisis together. They need, there is no, no space for conflict. And um, we, the, the, the corona uh, crisis shows very clearly that um, biodiversity and healthy nature is one of the most important thing to improve our health, but it's also having increased enormous impact on, um, on many other economic sectors. And um, in our region, we do have one of the 
the most rich biodiversity, but which uh, was forgotten for many years. And uh, there's an urgent need for improving the nature reserve restoration, nature protection. And this could be not only good for the biodiversity, but also an uh, important economic uh, activity because uh, biodiversity investment has similar rate of return or um, recovery aspect as the energy efficiency investment, for example. So we do believe that there need to be changes in the plan still and hope to have good collaboration also with the European Green Party in the future that uh, we do to, to further pressure the Commission to improve the, the final documents, which we will approve the plans and eventually set up a more transparent process for the monitoring of the plan because a lot of details um, we, we still need to know more or, or a lot more about the details of the plans and really spot further problematic cases where there might be a conflict with the biodiversity and climate objectives. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Anelia. So um, we have uh, two um, extra guests, which they have uh, the direct uh, experience from the national parliament. So we start with uh, Mal Gorzata, uh, obviously uh, in uh, the previous presentation, we did not touch so much uh, the rule of law, <laughs> also conditionality. What does it mean exactly uh, giving money to countries which uh, they have problems with the rule of law? Uh, but maybe Mal Gorzata, you can explain to us a little bit more what's going on in Poland and what are uh, your what is your assessment about uh, uh, the national Plan. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Thank you for having me here and thank you for all the voices of the experts uh, that uh, spoken before about the overview of the national plans. Um, I think I, I would say about two things. First of them, it's the process of the national plan implementation or creation in Poland. And secondly, about the specific things that we as Greens consider kind of dangerous or not ambitious enough in the Polish national plan. Uh, first of all, about the process. As you probably know, we as the opposition, we have no trust in our government. Uh, that's why we were uh, against, uh, I mean, there in Poland, there was no debate on the parliamentary, parliamentary level about the national plan. The government just created it. Then there were public consultations when uh, NGOs and local governments gave some amendments. Then the government implemented just some of them. And then when there was supposed to be the second round of amendments, the government decided to send the plan uh, to the European Commission. Uh, they send it one day when the next day was the meeting planned with the local authorities, organizations. Yeah, so basically the government didn't respect the voice of the local parliaments, of the local governments and the mayor of the cities. Um, we also, as the opposition, we wanted uh, Poland to join the European uh, prosecutor's office to be sure yeah, that they are, uh, that they are uh, some measures, some the way to control uh, how the money will be spent. It didn't happen. Uh, then we wanted monitoring committee that would consider from the government side, but also opposition side, experts, NGOs, civic society, mayors, or, or people delegated by the mayors. Uh, we have this monitoring committee uh, in the national plan, but it's basically everything depends on the minister, yeah? so the official of the government, so we also don't trust it. Uh, to be honest, the opposition also uh, did not good job in Poland because we fight it over it among opposition and also just two days ago we had um, let's say a huge mistake made by the senate that was supposed to when the opposition has the majority and was supposed to implement changes about uh, monitoring committee about the european prosecution's office but unfortunately our senators failed uh, on the way in the moment of voting yeah so that's why even more important uh, is our trust in European Commission and in experts to assess the Polish national plan. We as Greens, we see few problems. 
Firstly, climate targets. Uh, the climate targets are based on the Polish energy policy 2040 that, that is extremely unambitious. For example, one of the basis of this climate policy is that we reduce coal just to 60% by uh, 2030. So it, it has nothing to do with the European climate goals. Yeah, If in 20, 2030, Poland will still burn 60% of coal, yeah, to get the, I mean, burn coal to get 60% of the energy. Another thing is exchanging coal stoves into another coal stoves, but uh, modern ones. Yeah, but it still it still means that most of the houses in Poland uh, will use uh, coal to heat the 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 house, the flat. Uh, then we have uh, another issue that there's no innovative ideas in the national Polish plan. Basically, the work that was done was that the ideas from different ministries the ideas that the government had, but had no money, they put all of it together and put into the national plan. So we don't see the innovative component uh, in the whole national plan, just basically old ideas, um, which are not very uh, good ones. They were implemented a bit, for example, uh, I mean, improved a bit after the consultation with NGOs. Uh, for example, uh, firstly, the government wanted to develop only offshore uh, wind energy, only on the sea, uh, because from 2016, we had like extremely strict law for the onshore uh, wind energy. Basically, there's no new wind energy uh, investments, yeah, because we have the law that removes it. They put the um, promise that they will change the bill about it, but we don't know how. Uh, then about gender equality, also they are just the vague statements in the Polish national plan about it, but we don't see the realization of it uh, between the tasks yeah, that are in the national plan. So for example, it's about the taking care of a young kids up to three years old, but what about the kids that are um, above three years old uh, and still without any guard? Or for example, what about women that mostly in Poland taking care about elder members of the families? Yeah, and it's not paid uh, and it's a, it's a huge problem. Uh, then uh, we have a big problem with do no significant harm rule. Uh, we know it's one of the main rules, but um, some of the investments that are in the national plan, we are afraid that they might be against environment even. And just recently, uh, two weeks ago, we had a plenary session in the Polish parliament when the uh, ruling party presented the bill to pri privatized forests, woods, uh, for investments. Yeah, so basically they want to take the part of the woods uh, and change the status into the investment. So cut all of the trees and make investments there, for example, for, the, for building the factory for electric cars. So we would really appreciate uh, European Commission and of course uh, our green friends and friends from uh, NGOs to consider the plan, the Polish national plan about this do no uh, significant harm. Because if already in the Polish parliament, we have the bills against bio protecting biodiversity and cutting forests for investments, something is wrong. And just the last thing to, uh, to, to finish a bit, it's transparency. It's the main issue. Uh, we just had a few months ago the National Fund for Local Investments, uh, and it was money after pandemia, yeah? something like the recovery plan, European recovery plan, but we had it on the, on the national level. And basically the money that the government gave, they gave the money only to the cities, towns, and local governments uh, that have mayors, from law and justice, from the ruling party. Uh, 
Uh, for example, free LGBT zones. Probably you know the issue, yeah, that we have free LGBT zones in Poland. They got the money. But for example, the cities, mostly the voivodeship cities that support LGBT communities, that support women's rights, they got zero money from this fund. So we are afraid that it might be similar situation with the European funds, that there be no clear criteria which subject, which local government will receive the money, and the money will go only to the cities that are connected with the governments, yeah, by the, by the person of the mayor, or they support the government. And also another danger, because there's no clear, clear, uh, clear rules about who will get the money, we demand the transparency list, yeah, so we want to know which company or which uh, town got the money and for what? And what was the amount of money? Because we are afraid uh, that most of the money, especially for energy, uh, for renewable energy, will go to the uh, state control companies, energy companies. Uh, for example, the one that runs Turów Mine. As you know, right now, there is a case among between Poland and Czech about the Turów mine. And we're afraid that the money will not go to the mayor of the cities, not to the uh, small companies or to the citizens, but to the huge energy companies. And we will just not know for what they will spend the money. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> very concentrated and uh, extremely worried uh, uh, framework. Uh, so, Lorenzo, uh, the floor is yours. I'm also checking that I hope we will be able to have some extra minutes because I would like, obviously, to have the possibility to be able to answer to the questions and make the conclusions. Uh, so, Lorenzo. Thank you, Bula. Let's see if I manage to do it in four minutes. Um, thank you for inviting me to this event for this discussion. I have to congratulate everyone. Um, in the Italian case, I think, um, uh, we made progress. Um, I think Europe has been extremely useful at um, setting the stage and clarifying the boundaries. And Italians tend to tend to go astray when they don't have clear boundaries. So having set the 37%, having set the tax taxan um, taxonomy that tells us what is green and what is not green somehow helped a great deal. Yet many of us are not satisfied with the um, with the recovery plan, with the next generation Italy, as we call it. Um, first of all, there's a lot of greenwashing. Um, this is a major problem everywhere. It's always been a big problem everywhere, not just in Italy, but there's a lot of greenwashing. And I think the, the presentation earlier showed that in many cases, this is, this is still true. Not everything that is presented as green actually is green. Uh, when we will only know We'll only know after a, a certain time whether it's going to be really delivering on climate and biodiversity. Um, often with this narrative of the transition, somehow this narrative of the transition has backfired in Italy. You know, we were pushing for having a ministry for ecological transition, thinking this was going to speed up the process towards making ecological concerns very significant to government. But they highlighted somehow. Uh, the naysayers highlighted the issue of transition to so the concept of transition. And so many people are saying now, no, the fact that we have a ministry of transition means that we have to transition to different things and that will take time. A transition is long and curvy. And that means that instead of accelerating, we're actually delaying. Um, there's a lot of emphasis on hydrogen, which is a good thing. But as we know, hydrogen is not a mature technology, which means that in the meantime, until we're gonna have green, clean hydrogen, uh, most of it will be brown and gray, which is still based on fossil fuels. Um, gas is an issue. There's a lot of pressure for gas um, to be considered a transition uh, fuel, and that is uh, risky. Uh, the lock-in effects are significant. Once you have a technology, especially once you have a, an energy source, it's very hard to get away from that. From that, We've seen it everywhere around the world, in China and US, uh, based on carbon and so on and so forth. There is lack of ambition, extreme lack of ambition. It's not, you know, let me put it very simply. It's not that revolutionary plan you would expect uh, after such a pandemic. And not, not even um, that Green Deal that you would expect after 
the prolonged failure of European member states over so many years. I mean, I would like to remind everyone that the European Union is not really cutting down on emissions. It's simply shifting the responsibility for emissions to other countries because production chains have moved away from Europe. Now, most of what we buy is now made in India, China, Mexico, and so on and so forth. They take responsibility for polluting the planet, but we're still buying that stuff. So it's actually our responsibility. Having shifted production chains created this green clot, you know, this green image in Europe, which is not really supported by data. Um, I think in a sense, so there is a lack of ambition in Italy. There is a serious lack of ambition um, when it comes to using this as a revolutionary plan. There is no focus almost whatsoever on the issue of biodiversity, for instance. It's all on technology and technological transformation, but we know that a lot of um, positive effects on reducing carbon emissions and reducing in limiting climate change is by increasing biodiversity. Rather than building new plants, even green plants, which actually, which actually remember the word that plant is not just a factory, it's actually a plant, it's a tree, it's a flower. There's no issue at all on rewilding. I think this is a problem around Europe. I mean, we need to start talking about investing in rewilding Europe. As we know, that is the most viable and, 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 and effective technology to reduce um, um, greenhouse gas emissions and to capture carbon. And I think ultimately, I think the main issue here is that this is never gonna be, it may be more or less effective. I don't think we're gonna meet the targets. I think it's gonna be a big disappointment at the end of the day. It's gonna have some incremental marginal positive effects, but not what we expect. And this may be the only shot we have. We're not gonna have another recovery plan with so much debt, so much uh, effort in Europe in the next generation. I think not in my lifetime. So if we miss this one, we're gonna have to wait until 2060, 2050 to make, the, to make another one. And, and so the main issue here, what's the, what's the framework? Will it still be uh, in Europe, the Stability and Growth Pact? Because if that is the framework, we're off the mark. I think this is the opportunity for Europe to change the framework. The, what do we mean by growth? What do we mean by growth in the 21st century? I mean, it's, it's still obviously so, so paradoxical. We're still using a term that goes against everything we stand for. At the time when we all, and you know, science tells us that we need to change the concept of growth. We cannot be the same concept of growth we had in the past. And yet, what is the problem? That many governments are saying, well, if I don't invest in certain things that may be not so green, I'm not going to create a multiplier on GDP, and therefore, it's not going to be seen as a good investment. That is a mistake, because we shouldn't measure the effectiveness of the investments based on multipliers of GDP. We should measure the effect of the investments based on multipliers of other indicators that are not in the stability and growth pact, unfortunately. So unless Europe, and this is my conclusion, moves towards what I call, and I think there has been a call by the European Parliament a few years ago to rename the stability and growth pact, sustainability and well-being pact. I mean, those should be the two objectives. We need to create an economy which is based on increasing sustainability and increasing personal well-being, right? We, I think the pandemic has taught us that when people are sick, there's nothing else that you can, you, you can do in, in, in a society. So unless we change that framework, unfortunately, policymakers will continue reasoning in terms of GDP increase, GDP growth, GDP multipliers when they make green investments. And I'm, I'm sorry, that is not going to take us far. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Lorenzo. And uh, of course, this picture is uh, very, very, uh, very problematic also because there is a huge amount of uh, money that is going to Italy. And of course, that with the new government, we thought that something will change with the previous one. Uh, now, um, I managed to get, uh, let's say, um, in total, we will have uh, until uh, uh, 1555. Uh, so I hope you will not kill me, but this will give, these 10 extra minutes will give us the possibility to be able to respond to the different uh, questions we received. And if I'm missing something, please uh, uh, you uh, uh, let me know. Uh, so maybe uh, before uh, we start to respond uh, to, to the different questions, I have one or two reflections myself. Uh, the first one is, uh, uh, I would like uh, uh, Ernest uh, uh, to know a little bit more 
how many possibilities we have after July to change the plans. Of course, you mentioned that uh, uh, via the reforms that they have to be in the national parliaments, uh, they will be, it will be a way on the delivering phases to uh, be able to correct the things because if uh, I'm right, the regulation tells you without going to the right direction, you will not get money. But of course, at the same moment, the commission is doing this assessment and we will get the assessment of the plans in the second part of June. So if I understand well, after the 15th of June. So the commission can always say, yeah, we have assessed with our criteria. So the question is, do we have a margin of maneuver to change, yes or not? I ask that because I ask uh, this question, the same question to the civil servants of the commission. And they told me that, um, Things can change because, of course, the member states, they uh, presented these plans in a record time and the whole work is very much packed and under pressure, but it will be difficult to make modifications if there is no political will coming from the member states themselves, because if not, the process will be quite difficult, always because you need uh, first of all, the support of the Commission, but at the same moment, you need that the Council, it, the, the, the delegate acts go back to the Council, and if there are changes that they need really to be, um, to be uh, agreed also at the level of the Council. So this is uh, my first uh, question straight to you. And the second, it is uh, of um, a participant, a colleague, who say that given the as uncertainties that we have, do we need to make uh, uh, the recovery facility a permanent, um, permanent in the way, uh, let's say, that uh, the EU will finance and will support the different uh, member states, um, taking into con in consideration of what we hear until now, this resilient part is quite weak. So these are, uh, let's say, two concrete uh, questions uh, to, uh, to you. Um, they have uh, uh, been uh, some questions uh, which I will address mainly to Anelia. Um, the first one is uh, for the countries that uh, uh, we had public involvement, um, how this was done. So if you can explain to us a little bit more on that. And uh, uh, to um, oh, one of you, uh, especially from the experts, uh, is the question of uh, uh, aquaculture, marine and fishery found, if uh, this is part of the way also that you have evaluated uh, the, uh, uh, these, these uh, uh, parameters, if they have been evaluated uh, directly from you, maybe. Uh, this also question has been addressed to Timon and Felix. Uh, if both of you, you check the chat, uh, you will be able uh, to, to give us uh, the answer. And there is also our friend from Switzerland uh, that uh, um, explains that there are serious problems, uh, that uh, they don't have enough specialists and professionals for the green transformation, and that we are looking for this technical uh, support. Uh, so if uh, we can just get some more information on that. And um, one extra question from me, and I apologize if you already have raised it, but um, uh, how much you know of the methodology uh, that the commission used uh, to go through the different parameters and to evaluate uh, the compatibility with the climate goals, with taxonomy, et cetera, et cetera. And what are the main differences from the methodology, if you know that the commission used, of the methodology that you have used, because you uh, make when you make the presentation, you say, yes, but we have to readjust some things. So I will say that if we are able to go through these questions, I hope we will have some extra time to go back to everyone for, uh, for a second short round. So I will start with Ernest, and then with Anelia, and then with uh, Timon and Felix. Thank you so much, Vula. Uh, okay, so uh, two things. 
so on our capacity to influence the um, the national recovery plans the process is permanent in the sense that we are in the in the most important phase which is the design of the plans okay uh, but some people tend to think that once those plans are approved uh, then it's the end of the story that's not the case okay because the way the rf will function is basically that the commission will be paying statements after the fulfillment of uh, uh, some uh, criteria negotiated by the commission so um, the commission will be disbursing in three or four installments per year uh, so the the, the pre-financing will come in july uh, uh, gentiloni is, is talking maybe that the second installment could come at the end of this year already if we go fast but this will will, go, will 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 come only if a certain criteria are met so that's why the working group that we have in the parliament, of course, it has the, the majority of its work now to analyze the plans, but it will continue uh, because if anything goes wrong in any member state, then we will can have the capacity to tell the commission to block the payments. Uh, this, this will be happening. I mean. So this is, um, this is, of course, important. Now, on the capacity to influence the plans, well, to be very honest with you, it's more political than legal. And this is something that we did not manage to put in the regulation, because in the regulation we wanted the national recovery plans to be issued, to be approved by the Commission through delegated acts, which would give the Parliament the capacity to block the approval. Okay, That we did not manage to have, because the regulation talks about implementing acts, which of course means the Parliament cannot block them, it goes directly to Council and it's only the Council that they can be blocked. Okay, But that doesn't mean, of course, that we cannot put political pressure and influence the plans. We can, of course, if the Parliament really and the committee that controls that makes the, the, the point and the case for a certain recovery plan not meeting the criteria, the Commission cannot ignore that. So uh, that's why our, our, our role here as a parliamentarians is very important. And that's why we are trying to gather uh, all the information as possible. And for instance, I was listening very carefully to everything that was been telling, uh, uh, said by our, our friend from Poland. We, we would be very much uh, like to be in contact with you. Uh, really, if there is a, a general problem with the Polish plan, so we can really address that with the Commission. So I think that we will have an influence. We don't have a, a legal capacity to block it, but we are going to have an influence. And what we need to do is to use it as much as possible. Uh, also, because uh, uh, Lorenzo was saying something that I fully agree, this is the last chance in the sense that if we want to meet the goals of, uh, uh, of uh, target uh, emission reduction of 2030, we are not going to have uh, uh, such an investment in in, uh, in in five years time. This is a one shot that we need to use well. And then I will come to your second question, Vula. Uh, it was made by the, somebody in the, in the chat about the need of making, making uh, the instrument permanent. I fully agree on that. Uh, we have always considered that the, uh, the this is an investment capacity that is the seed of a real uh, European treasury with the capacity of investing. Now, of course, uh, we have a legal problem because this has been uh, built uh, on, uh, on uh, with the legal basis of our Article 122 of the Treaty of Functioning of the European Union, which does not allow you to make it permanent. But what we could do, and this is something that we are reflecting a bit, also like Lorenzo was saying, is that we can say that we need a fund uh, to address the climate emergency permanently, right? and that would give a re really we could use the legal grounds of Article 122 to make it permanent and to make it broader. Right? This is something that in the economic team of the of the group, we are working on it at the moment, uh, because we're discussing a bit something that Lorenzo also addressed, which, which is the change of the fiscal rules in general, which is a debate that we will come after the after summer and we are getting ourselves ready for that debate. But we are absolutely convinced that we need to, to make that instrument permanent and there are ways of, of doing that with the, with the current treaties. Um, and uh, so voila, so this is something, and because also another thing that I don't want to forget, that we need to make it permanent because the, the numbers, if you take the 700, 750 billion, of course, is a huge amount of investment, uh, but, uh, but it, it will lack short uh, in the coming uh, uh, for the investment needs that we need, huh? so the needs of investment and and the uh, and investment has been followed falling in all the member states in the last years. And to achieve energy transition, we need to have a, a bigger instrument. And you 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 only need to compare our instruments with the level of public spending that the US is mobilizing nowadays. So we need more. And I think that the, that this for sure should, uh, is something that the Greens should fight for. Thank you. And of course, taking into account that. Uh in uh, difference from uh, uh, the 
money that they have been the loans that we get into we got in 2009 now there is a big uh, revolution because also we have the grants and that is something that the group politically fight a lot we have uh, own resources so something is moving also in the direction of uh, uh, a common sharing so politically as Anna Lena said yesterday evening in the meeting we had uh, it is also part of, uh, of our victory, part of our fight uh, through the years. And of course, now it is more the quality spending that we have to, to make sure that happens. So it is an extra reason uh, to, uh, let's say, to question the quality, but not to, to question uh, the basis of this mechanism, which of course needs to be improved uh, for all the reasons that they have been uh, mentioned. And indeed, one of the things that needs to be mentioned and earlier um, change is uh, the way, the participative way. So uh, please, uh, you had uh, some questions for you. So the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, and already mentioned that indeed the legal framework was very um, not so good as we would like to see it in terms of public participation. Um, for example, cohesion funds have a partnership principle, which is something which is rather strong in terms of stakeholders involvement. We didn't have nothing like that in the um, in the recovery plans. So a lot was de depends on the pressure of civil society and um, I mean like also the stakeholders and um, the goodwill of the government. So good examples which I could mention which is also far from perfect, um, just like to <laughs> mention it clearly. Our colleagues in Slovakia were involved already in June last year when the government started to uh, to, um, to make a first consultation demand asking uh, also local authorities, stakeholders, different stakeholders to propose measures and priorities for the, for the Slovakian plan. And no, indeed the Slovakian plan since the beginning was slightly more progressive than the rest of the, the C countries plans. And they had few few rounds of public consultations. Um, uh, uh, of course, there was a moment where in December, the Slovakian government sent the plan to the to the commission without publishing it and without, I mean, discussing the final, the, this draft. But um, I mean, there were a number of in public uh, consultations through the face-to-face -face meetings and the information most of the time was available on the online. So in, in this, I could show this is one of the good examples. In the same time, in some other countries, the commission did play an important role. I mean, the commission delegation in, in Hungary, for example, organized by themselves a public consultation to manage to get public opinion on the recovery plan in Hungary because Hungary was one of the last country which published the plans, for example. Um, and um, I just want to mention that um, indeed the, the, the legal framework was weak, but still our, the civil society was trying to organize themselves and be actively, I mean, approaching the government, like Polish in, in Poland, our colleagues were addressed the government with open letter with public actions and did manage at the end to have some public, large public consultations. Um, and uh, which improved the measures. I mean, some of the, unfortunately, uh, some of the, the measures like uh, sustainable forestry management in Latvia was removed or, uh, we, I mean, irrigation measures also, um, which was proposed in Hungary, again, uh, very unsustainable, was also removed from the plants. It, it was a combination of public pressure and uh, good contacts with the commission, uh, which um, in the case they have information, they could prove that do not significant harm principle was not implemented. And, and then ask the government to remove certain measures from the plan. So again, back to this issue of the transparency, it's, it's crucial. It's crucial, especially for monitoring of the plan's implementation. Uh, this is a new, we have a new system. Every six months, the plans would be assessed. So about the, about the progress, but without transparency about what exactly is financed by the plans, we could not provide from the ground information if if the, this is really going in the direction of supporting the measures which are not in conflict with unit with the uh, legislation and also to to propose to also to highlight this aspect of reforms which is necessary to complement measures because EU subsidies or like the this precious for public funds we our our kids would play uh, pay basically the debt about that need to be really wisely invested today in uh, in things which are enabling transformation thank you very little from that yeah thank you very much but indeed is extremely worried because if you have to have friends in the commission uh, to be to alert them in time what's going on it means something is really problematic in the way that as you mentioned 
the plans that have been shared, and this should be part also of the reforms in case this instrument becomes uh, permanent in whatever form will become uh, permanent. Timon and, um, and Felix. Thank you so much. Yeah. We agree that I'll quickly answer those questions. Um, perhaps briefly, just one reflection on also what Anelia just said. I think one thing that I've also really seen working in, I think, 20 EU states really with civil society on those plans and sort of really trying to understand what's happening in the country is just how much knowledge and sort of expertise, but also commitment there is on the ground, both with civil society, but also, of course, MPs with also MEPs and others in the European Parliament. So I think this process also showed the great potential there is to really uh, deliver a better recovery, to really do those things. And I think that's been one of the more uplifting things I've seen, that there's loads of great ideas, sort of really skills out there. But um, I don't want to evade the questions. Um, the first one uh, from Charles on uh, fisheries is a really quick one to answer. We don't really look at that, I'm afraid. And also one thing we've seen, if you look at the sort of split of recovery spending by sector, which you can do on our website, um, there's very little funding overall going to agriculture, going to forestry. So the whole sort of sector around that is receiving very little funding um, with regards to recovery spending overall as well. Um, on the question on where does our methodology deviate from what the commission is doing? So I actually have the Annex 6, so you can't see it now, but this is the Annex 6 of the regulation always uh, lying next to my desk because we do look at it very regularly and we do try to figure out, okay, where do we deviate? Where do we align with what the commission is doing? And, and it's a split, honestly. So there's some measures which we think in national plans are really getting wrong climate tax. And um, just to give you some examples, um, in the Polish plan, the hydrogen. Uh, we lost you. I'm really now maybe you're back. I can hear you. Yes, now yes, please. Sorry about that. Um, hopefully it works. So just giving some examples on where and a really wrongly climate tax. So for example, in the Polish plan, we see hydrogen being tacked as 100% climate. Uh, we see uh, house building being tacked as contributing to a smart energy system when probably you know doesn't really do that. Um, we have some problematic cases as well, where for example, adaptation measures are probably correctly tacked based on the methodology, but may just be you know um, concrete dams being built somewhere. So really also probably being DNSH breaches. So there's uh, so sorry, you know, significant harm breaches. So there's a lot of cases where. Um, it's really questionable based on the methodology, but we also, in some cases, to be honest with you, do go further. So we do have some tricky cases where, for example, the Italian plan, which uh, we'll release our analysis on that next week, uh, first day, um, has a lot of investments into high-speed rail, which if you look at the methodology from a purely sort of legal point of view, that's a 10 t rail investment in most cases, which based on the methodology gets the best climate assessment. But if we look at it from the perspective of, okay, what may be most necessary based on for the green transition in Italy, uh, that's probably a lot of money being spent where it doesn't have the biggest impact. At least that's what our national partners also think. So um, I think that's probably also one of the reflections um, for the process moving forward. I think the regulation is really strong, but but someone else uh, has said this, it can fight illegal stuff right now and it can't fight maybe not very smart stuff. So that's probably the challenge as well when thinking about how to develop this further, also for climate mainstreaming and other budgets, et cetera. How can we make this leap from, okay, things may look really green on paper, but uh, just saying, okay, it's a rail investment, so that's a positive thing, which of course is true, doesn't capture the dimension of, but is it in line with where the money would be most necessary? So we um, sometimes through sort of one step, uh, uh, one step worse assessment on methodology, try to capture that. So perhaps it's 50-50 uh, cases where we are more stringent than the regulation, but also really cases where governments have just really used the wrong climate tax. And we've shared that information as well with, with the Greens and others in the European Parliament to really make that transparent and raise the alarm on that. Thank you. I suppose that uh, the question was covered, uh, Timon, correct, uh, straight by Felix. Uh, so um, uh, it has been an, another uh, question on, uh, uh, but I can reply myself on an alias, which is the question, what can we do if uh, the transparency is not there, et cetera, et cetera. We know that unfortunately in the regulation, everything that it is linked to uh, public consultation and involvement of the partners, uh, it is not an obligation. It is uh, just uh, an asset, but uh, it has not been unfortunately uh, uh, mandatory and therefore I think that as Ernest mentioned the public pressure is uh, and the political pressure is the most important thing that we can do for the moment and uh, maybe a last uh, word before I conclude the last minute Lorenzo uh, and also Mal Gorzata I would like to ask you starting this time from Lorenzo um, what are you expecting, let's say, also from us, uh, or what are your ideas for action 
in such a complicated situation. Of course, it's one minute is not enough, but maybe you could just tell us uh, what are your ideas for the next steps, of course. Well, I think what Ernest said is, is, is critical, right? I mean, this cannot be a one shot. It needs to be part of a bigger framework. We need to reform our fiscal rules and our macroeconomic rules because it, the two things have to talk to one another, right? So for as long as our macroeconomic rules are telling us that we need to do A, and then the planet tells us we need to do B, uh, we're never going to reconcile the two things. Um, again, also from a national perspective, because national lawmakers expect Europe to go back to normal once this is over. So they're already planning for when Europe goes back to normal, what is going to happen to us? So if we make investments that are, generate, are going to generate a certain type of outcome, we're going to be rewarded by Europe even later. Um, and this is problematic because I think we require a fundamental shift. So I think building... I think you've done a great job at explaining to us today and discussing with everyone who's watching how the next generation EU works. But I think the Greens need to do more than that, need to say, we're not completely happy with this. I think more needs to be done. The planet doesn't sign off on Excel sheets. And, and therefore, you know, we need to make sure that this is the beginning of a new era, not just a, 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 a momentary um, concern so as that so that we can go back to you know business as usual that's it thank you uh Malgorzata, you have 30 seconds because the last 30 i would like to use them to conclude <laughs> okay so thank you for all the ideas i really like these four ideas you mentioned to do as a group yeah that means the uh, letter to the Commission about general national plans and climate there then the resolution of European Parliament then the idea of permanent climate fund and also about focusing on the Polish uh, national plan. I think we started it somehow, uh, Ursula Zielinska, our MEP from Greens, uh, she started the letter to Ursula von der Leyen with the group, yeah? So I guess it's kind of in progress, but we would like to stay in touch with you. Probably we'll give it to Ula because she's already yeah, in, the, in the topic, but let's be in touch. And uh, we also, I hope, a lot for this green uh, recovery tracker, because I see right now there's the, um, the analysis of the plan from uh, from February this year, and would be great to have the same about climate issues, especially for the one that went to European Commission, yeah, because it would be for us powerful tool as well. I don't believe that there's 38, 7% there, yeah. Thank you very much. Maybe really on telegraphic, two, three things from my side. First of all, during this uh, uh, council, we are voting a resolution, a political uh, resolution, which has been, uh, by the way, adopted. So that's done. The second issue is uh, uh, you will receive very soon uh, Ernest by Ernest and myself a letter which probably also has been done. The things are going very, very fast, where we are asking you as soon as possible to give us very, very concrete uh, um, proposals linked to what's going wrong in order to uh, include them in, uh, uh, in the letter, which we plan to send in the European Commission next Tuesday. And therefore, the time is running. And uh, please, in case you didn't receive the letter or you missed it, uh, you just uh, have the opportunity, all of you, now to send it to Ernest Urtasun with copy to me uh, in order really to be able to include the information uh, as soon as possible in this first phase uh, to be addressed to the Commission. Uh, you should also know that as a European Green Party, uh, we are working very closely with the group uh, uh, to follow these plans, to follow the whole process. We have also some funds um, in uh, and some budget for some uh, transnational projects to be able really to, um, to make some extra studies. For example, I'll just give an example, uh, Wuppertal Institute focused so much on uh, the ecological part, the climate. Uh, maybe if they, we have a lot of time and uh, a need, we can also make a study uh, without promising on the social dimension. So uh, these kind of things we will follow very, very, very closely. And last but not least, in parallel of what we are doing with the recovery plans, we are in very close contact with the Commissioner Sinkevicius, who is the Commissioner for uh, the European Commissioner for the 
um, uh, environment and he follows everything that it is linked to the infringement procedures and the non-respect from the current legislation to the environment, because I really think that these two things, we need to follow them in parallel, what's going wrong without the plans and what is going wrong with the plans and with the rest of, of course, the founts. So it was a big pleasure to see you uh, today, a little bit stressed at the end, but uh, I'm sure that we will continue. And as Ernest mentioned, very soon we will organize a conference where we will invite uh, um, NGOs, where we will invite national parliamentarians, but also mayors, to be able to discuss with you the further uh, steps that we will uh, take. Thank you, and uh, they will kill me. <laughs> bye bye. The Thank next you. session starts Thank exactly you. in one minute. Thank you. Bye. Thank you to all of you. Thank you. Bye bye. bye.